Hello everyone and welcome to our next video in the sequence on uh, optimization for machine learning. What we have seen until now is the question about the gradient descent algorithm, right? And so here, this is only part of it. Uh, what we had in the general setting was the, the update is wi plus eta times v. What we have also seen is then in the most, uh, in most settings that we are interested in is that we consider the steepest descent direction, right? Which is that we take as our v minus the gradient of the loss function. And so what I would like to address now is the question, what if this is not so cheaply evaluated? If you look at this, the loss is really the average over the individual sample loss. And what you can see in pink here is the individual loss in if we take a squared loss function. So it's usually the output minus the input mapped forward by our model and you would like to minimize the distance. And so this is a loss function that is defined sample by sample. And in order to get our loss function, we take the average over these. And so the question I would like to address here is, what if the evaluation of this loss function is expensive, right? So part one would be, what if um, not necessarily the big L, but let's say the small L is expensive to evaluate. Well, and this seems weird at the moment, maybe because we have until now mostly discussed linear models. And so calculating the gradient is an easy thing to do. But uh, at la well, finally, if we get to, to neural networks or more complicated nonlinear models, we can see that computing this gradient can actually be quite costly. Because what you need is, if we're talking about deep learning, a forward pass through the network and then the back propagation algorithm, which will give us this derivative. And this can be really costly. And so a second point makes this thing even more challenging, right? This is question one. Question two is what if this n grows large, right? I guess you have all heard that machine learning is only popular because we nowadays have, uh, nowadays have these immense data sets, large, large uh, amounts of data is freely available in the internet and so on. So this n tends to be very, very large in many applications. And so we have two points driving the cost of this, right? So the individual component can be expensive. And then if we have a lot of samples, we sum up an expensive calculation over a large number of, of samples. So two tests um, that we would like to, to reduce in cost in a way to, to become more effective, right? And so reducing the cost of an individual evaluation is rather challenging. Right? It's very model dependent and you have to play a lot of tricks and, and exploit structure. And so this is also often a matter of programming. But the second thing is, the second question here is something that we do have access to actually, right? So think about what can you do to reduce it, right? So the simple answer might be, okay, let's reduce N. Um, and well, this is also something we are going to discuss in the area of model selection. If we have a model that has a large number of parameters, Okay, so in a linear model, we have seen that the parameters don't grow quickly. They usually scale with the number of features or with the number of inputs. So in a, handle, in, 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 in a, in a range that is, can be handled oftentimes. But for neural networks, this can become really large. And if we're talking about generalization, we will see that this n should be proportional to um, the number of parameters we have in our model. And usually it should be significantly larger than the number of parameters. So Simply saying, let's kick out all of our data is not an option. What we can do though, is we can use a subsample of this, right? So let's take a very brutal approach and say, instead of calculating the gradient by averaging over all of them, we just take one sample randomly. At random. So what does this do with our gradient descent algorithm here? What we will get is a very simple adaptation. So the new iterate for our weight is the old weight value. And then the update is again minus the learning rate.
But now I'm not taking the capital L. What I'm going to do is I'm taking the capital lowercase l j of wi, where this j is drawn from a uniform distribution over the set of all samples. Okay, so what this means is basically I randomly pick one of the samples with arbitrary probability or with, with equal probability. All of them have the same probability of being drawn. And now you see, I've reduced the cost by large n. And if n is a million or a billion, I have massively reduced my cost. And so the question is, clearly, can this work? Right, you might say, okay, I cheated in a sense. Um, I'm, I'm drawing this randomly, so apparently every time I do an update, I, I draw again. So I'm not training for one sample all the time, but every time I do this iteration, I draw again. So the minimum of my loss function tends to wobble around a little bit, right? Because a parameter set might give me an optimum here for a particular set of samples, and then the optimum might shift to another area. So this is slightly vague, and this is where the name stochastic comes from in the end. So there's we, we have some randomness, not because the the problem itself is inherently stochastic, but due to this randomness we introduced to, to, uh, or introduced to reduce our cost. And so the question is, can this really work? It seems like, well, a little bit cheating. And so the magic answer is, it can work if we look at the expectation. So in expectation, we may have a chance. This is really the important thing, and we will see in all of machine learning, probabilistic approaches really play an important role. And so let's look at this equation once more, but let's only look at the expected value. Okay, so this is a, now a few computations, but actually very straightforward. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking at the expectation of my updated weights. So right, if I repeat the learning process often enough, what would I get as my expected value of my weight update? And this is simply the expected value of this expression. So what I'm doing now is nothing but replacing this by this. So it's the expectation of my update rule. And now we can look at this a little bit more in detail. What you see it's a sum, so we can separate the sum. And then we see the eta is a parameter that we have fixed uh, uh, beforehand, so it comes out of the expected value. So what I'm going to do is two steps at the same time. I'm considering the expectation of my current weight minus eta times the expectation of the gradient of Lj of my current weight vector wi. And so what we see is we get an update of my expected value of my current weight to the expected value of the weight at the next iteration, which is decided by eta times the expectation of this uh, gradient in the subsampling set. And now if you consider this, an expectation is maybe something um, that may look frightening if we don't really know what the data set is or hard to compute. But here's actually very simple, right? We do have a finite set of samples. So computing this expectation is really just taking the mean of our data set. So what you see, this expectation is exactly the average over my data set, which has a finite size. Okay? So I can simply replace this expected value by the expression here. So what I get is the expected value of the current weight minus eta times now the true gradient, or the full gradient. And so you see, this makes us very happy. In expectation, we do get the correct update. And so uh, the question is now, how well does this work? Right? It seems a little bit like uh, a dream come true, but the expectation may also be somewhat misleading, okay? because Expectation does not tell us a lot about variance. It means, well, the expectation is correct, but maybe this varies a lot. And so to reduce the fluctuations, we will see this in, in, in our Julia code in a second, to make these fluctuations 
smaller, what we will be using is what is called a mini batch. Right, so this is really important because what we can do now is we can say, okay, let's not draw a single sample, but let's replace this expensive gradient, which is the average over capital N samples, by a number of, oh, there's an H missing here, by a sample size that we will denote by S. Okay, so instead of, let's say, a million samples, we are going to take 10. And so all of a sudden, I still have a significant decrease in my cost, but I do have um, a little bit more robustness against these fluctuations of the individual samples. And this is something we can now study in our code. So here is um, the stochastic gradient descent method where we can now look at just a second here. This is the function I have implemented to show you the mini batch size. So what you see is we insert our current weights, the input data and the output data set, the entire set. And then there's a fourth parameter, the S, so the batch size, which is default would be one, meaning we have this classical vanilla stochastic gradient descent as I've written it here. But if we de increase the S, we get this mini batch version. So what I'm going to do is now capital N is the size of our entire data set. And then the indices I'm taking is just a sampling from the interval one to N. So exactly as I wrote it here, right? Uniform sampling from the interval one to N. But now I'm not taking one, I could take one, but I can, can take more than one without replacement. So I just sample a subset randomly. And now what I'm doing is exactly what I did before because we are still in the setting where we want to fit a third order polynomial to a sine function. So we have a linear model. I have explicit uh, expressions for the loss and also for the derivative. So you see this is just the two norm between output minus input um, mapped through the model, which is z times w, a linear model, and so the derivative can also be explicitly computed. And what you see, the key difference is now I'm not averaging over capital N, but I'm averaging over S samples instead. So if we do now, now do this, so the code does not really matter all that much. The only thing that really does matter is that in our loop now, what we are going to do is we calculate the stochastic loss function gradient, and then we do the gradient descent update exactly as we did it before, only that we now are not considering the full gradient, but the stochastic gradient. And what I'm doing here is I'm running a loop over different values of S. See here, S is between one and nine. So the full sample set or close to the full because I have 10 samples overall, this is a small example. And then I'm trying to compare this for different learning rates or step lengths. And so what we get after plotting this is this uh, specific behavior. So you see on the left-hand side, the plot with 10 to the minus four as my step length. And this is exactly what we expected, right? So you see in blue, or let me scroll a bit further down to see the legend. Blue means um, a sample size of one. So the, really the classic stochastic gradient descent. And then we are increasing step by step towards sample size of nine, which is close to the full gradient, which consists of, of 10 samples. So you see the fluctuations go down quite a bit. And if we now increase the step length, these fluctuations become or tend to become really crazy. Um, on the other hand, please have a look at that these axes uh, are scaled differently. So larger step sizes give me a favorable behavior in, form, in terms of you know, how many iterations I need. But I need to pick a trade-off maybe between um, the noise level, which I can tune due to selecting the, the batch size, and uh, the step length. And then again, this is also a trade of how many iterations do I need versus how much do I need to pay for a single iteration. And so in terms of situations where the cost function and the gradient in particular are expensive to simulate, this is a trade off that is not so easy to pick. And this depends a lot on, of, on the experience of, of the, the machine learning expert. And so let's close with a look at the parameter space. So here I have a contour plot of my loss function, but I'm only looking at the first two weights. Uh, if I'm trying to fit a third order polynomial, this would be a plot in 4D, which is hard to visualize, obviously. So I'm setting W3 and 4 to the optimal values that I know from the pseudo inverse solution and just looking at the projection onto coordinates two and, and one here. And so you see that starting from this point zero, zero, so all fours are zero, to the optimum, which is determined by the pseudo inverse, 
we see exactly this behavior, right? So the one, the color code is now a little bit different because I'm starting at, oh, I'm, I'm not considering the, the nine sample version here um, in order not to, to crowd the plot too much. But what you see is that we have this very, very wiggly behavior for the small sample size and we get smoother and smoother the more samples we consider. But keep in mind, we also have to pay for it because the seven sample size now has seven times the price for each iteration. So again, there's a trade-off to be chosen between small sample sizes and the noise we can accept. And so this concludes our part on, on optimization without constraints, and we are going to discover a little bit more in the next videos how we can also deal with constraint optimization problems, which can be very important if we consider um, in particular physical constraints or maybe constraints about, well, sizes of the parameters and so on. Thank you.